clients who have been growing not just in Saudi but globally uh, using our support but also using the ambitions of the nation we have a great commitment to grow our team with you so we are here today not just to present but we are here to really hear you out and try to find as many talent as possible to join our journey so today uh, myself I'm, uh, my name is Hani Tame I'm the partner heading the topic of sustainability and waste management. This is a new practice that was launched, uh, relatively new, that was launched here in the Middle East. And you know, one of the large projects we've done is support actually Saudi to set up the whole sector for waste management. And that's the kind of, you know, the kind of topic and the type of greatness that we are able to do uh, in Saudi and we want to replicate. Along, uh, along me today, we have uh, several of my colleagues, each at a different position in the firm, and that's intentional and by design. So you can understand the different levels in the, in the company and what we do uh, for in those different levels. But I will invite each one of my colleagues, whenever he's presenting one of the sections, to present himself and to provide a little bit of background of what kind of projects and what what is it that he's doing uh, uh, in Saudi and beyond. So what is it that we'll present to you today? First of all, how to be, you know, part of our story. Roland Berger is not a new firm, so we are going to present to you what's our history. And, and some of you might not have heard about us, but hopefully many have already. And for those who didn't, we hope to show you today what we stand for and what makes us unique. Second, we'll talk about our values. And this is what we stand for and what we live in and how we work. Our values are something that are not just words on paper. This is something that we truly believe in. And the good news about our values is that we had them since establishment. So we never changed our values and we never will. Then we'll talk to you about what's in it for you. So why should you actually join us? And this is, you know, hopefully today we'll pitch what is it that's so special that will attract you to us. And we'll explain to you how to join us. So we'll show you the different paths, the different programs, and we have some nice programs that we're adding, which the team will be telling you about. And finally, we want to inspire you by a TED talk. This is what consulting do. This is what the type of work we do. And we chose automotive being a German firm which is the most important topic for us as, as a German company. And hopefully will inspire some of you who likes cars, but also even those who don't like cars, like myself, I must admit, um, I, I like them just not too, too much. Uh, you, you at least will understand basically what, how we think and how we behave and what kind of content we create. So to tell you more about our story, here are some nice facts and figures. First of all, we started in 1967 by no other but Roland Berger himself. So Roland Berger is the actual founder of our firm. He still is there. He's our honorary chairman. Uh, at the time, you know, it was mainly himself and uh, even his mother was the accountant of the firm. So it was a very, uh, I would say, family-based uh, company. But what made him quite special is at the fall of the wall in Germany, what happened is that many companies needed restructuring. And he was there and he started presenting that restructuring skill. He became so famous to the point that even banks could not accept a case of bankruptcy without them uh, hiring Roland Berger to help restructuring. Now, with time, we went, of course, beyond uh, Germany, we started first expanding in Europe, but then really expanded worldwide. And we, we passed the target of the 1 billion already in 2001. And 2015 was a very important date for us because 2015 was the date where we actually launched a new strategy, a new way of thinking. And what, what was special about that is how close we were to technology. So we became a company that's very close to the digital world, to the technology, and we have the strategy that we're following today. Just recently, we also have gone through one more round of refinement to our technology 
to bring in the challenges of the world uh, as we stand, namely, for example, sustainability, which is what uh, I do. Our firm is a partnership, so we basically own our firm. When you start the when you start in the company, you can grow through the ranks all the way to become actually an owner, like like for example what I did. So if we if we look into the mix of our office, and this is already the first differentiation. If we can go to the next slide. This is something you will hardly see typically in companies, uh, in consulting companies, especially here in the Middle East. Our firm has, I believe, more than 25 different nationalities. And here we're talking about 120 or 130 consultants in the region. So you can imagine the kind of mix we have. We care about diversity a lot. And we intentionally make sure that even from our recruitment, we always make sure to be diversified and what this brings is a very nice mix of friendships it brings a very much nice mix of ideas that will come into our projects and when you will see later on our values you will understand that you know when you have such mix of diversity when you have different cultures the entrepreneurship that that this created is tremendous and we are very much excited, you know, of having multiple of our colleagues being from Saudi already, and we're hoping to grow that presence much, much more even in the future. So who, would you, who do we serve as clients? You will see some names here in the background that you probably will relate to. And in reality, we almost can say that any big client, has, any big uh, company has already been our client. Any public sector entity in the region already is our client. But what is more important to us than the names of the client is the fact that 75% of those clients are actually repeat clients. And this is very important because when we go to a client, we don't go to sell projects. We are not into that business. We go to become partners. And we really serve our clients to help them grow. You will have, of course, lots of questions of the basics, like what is consulting, right? I like to give a, a small description uh, to, to, to simplify it. And that's basically how I tell the people around me to better understand my job. We are very simply the doctors for companies. So when companies don't feel well, they come to us, right? If they want to grow, we can help them. If they want to restructure, we can help them. But if also they want to have new ideas, if they want to participate in acquisitions, if they want to do something different or create impact or re realize Vision 2030, this is what we do. So we have a very nice mix of industries and competency functions, which you will hear about throughout this presentation. And basically with that, maybe we'll, we'll move to the next uh, slide. And I leave it to my colleague to explain more about our DNA and what we really stand for. Yes. Thanks a lot, Hani, for the introductory work, words. Um, I'm Yannick. I've been with the company now three years and now uh, in a rank of a consultant. I think uh, tonight I'm the only uh, non-Arabic speaker here. So probably it was because of me that we now all have to switch to English. So uh, I hope that's fine with everybody. Thanks a lot. So yeah, I have the honor of presenting our company values. Um, there are three of them, entrepreneurship, excellence, and empathy. Now they seem as they are very abstract terms. What do they really mean? So let me just go a bit into details here. Entrepreneurship means as a company, we want to think like entrepreneurs, right? What does entrepreneur, entrepreneurs do? They reinvent themselves. They see an opportunity in the, mar in the market that they aim to seize, right? This is very much what we are doing in the market on our project ourselves. So when we are helping our clients, we are also trying to help them reinvent themselves and uh, get a new perspective on their business that they have, right? And for each and everyone individually, this means that um, as a team, as a project team that you come together to solve a problem, everybody has to contribute their own ideas to, the, to this mix, right? And once you contribute it, you are demanded and uh, to, to take real ownership of this, right? So 
like an entrepreneur, you will take an idea forward, you will test it, and then you come back to the team, right? So entrepreneurship means we would like to reinvent and take a new path with our client. Excellence, yeah, this is actually why we're here tonight, and this is why we are uh, presenting to you guys. Excellence means we would like to hire the brightest people out there in the market, the brightest graduates, right? And this is why, like I said tonight, we are actually, yeah, stay on that slide, uh, why, we are, why we are presenting to you guys, right? We are looking to hire the brightest minds. But then also throughout your journey at Roland Berger, you will go through a lot of training to further improve this aspect, right? So there's informal training on the project itself. So you'll be learning a lot hands-on, right? You'll be throwing into cold water a lot, right? But at the same time, you go through very formal training that prepares, prepares you for every new role. So as a new joiner, for instance, you go through like a, a kickoff training. Now in my role as a consultant, I'll be going to a, a senior consultant bootcamp that will prepare me to for the next role that I'll be taking. So we always make sure that the people we have in the company are excellent and that the results we're delivering are matching this. And then third, there's empathy. And uh, empathy means that we put ourselves into the shoes of somebody else. So we are putting ourselves in the shoes of our clients but also in the shoes of our colleagues, right? We seek to understand them and we seek to yeah, really understand what drives them in the end. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is like Hani said uh, earlier, we are cherishing the diversity and uh, the intercultural linkages that we have in our company, right? Uh, we are tolerant and we're respecting to each and everybody. And then uh, lastly, empathy also means that we are empathetic when we are receiving and we are giving feedback to others, right? We're receiving it to help ourselves grow and we're giving it to help somebody else grow. And that is always the mindset. And this is what we mean by entrepreneurship, excellence and empathy, our three values. If we can move to the, yeah, perfect. And then, um, the second point in this section is how do we work together? Uh, how do we work uh, when we approach a project? And um, to understand this, I'll very briefly explain how our, our company is structured. And uh, as you can see, we have industries and functions here. These are actually representing competence centers that we have at Roland Berger. So we have competence centers for automotive, chemicals and pharma, et cetera, et cetera. That means that throughout your journey as a junior, uh, once you become senior in the Middle East, you will uh, affiliate with one of these um, competence centers. And then this is where, like Hani, for instance, uh, in, the, in the area of waste management, this is where you will develop true expertise. So then in the future, and this is where I'm answering how we work together, how we work, when in the future, then there is a project coming along that is, for instance, on waste management or that is on automotive, we will engage those people that have grown in that direction, right? That have the knowledge and understanding to help our uh, client in that respective field, right? And this is how we aim to staff the best people that we can on a given assignment of our client. client. And I think with that, we can uh, move on to the next section. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Janil Haj. I'm a consulting analyst at Roland Berger. I've been with the firm for the past year. I graduated from the American University of Beirut as an electrical engineer, and I have actually met Roland Berger in one of his uh, presentations at the UB. So obviously you guys know uh, that consulting is a lot of hard work and long hours. But at the end of the day, there is something in it for you as an individual as well. So uh, how can RB support you? So I have been uh, lucky enough to receive a lot of support from RB on the personal and professional side uh, within work and even outside of work. So that allows me to speak uh, freely about this section. There are actually three uh, main areas where 
you can expect to have certified support from Roland Burger. So the first one is trainings. Uh, so it's a mix of mandatory trainings and uh, trainings that you can get to take within RB or outside RB. You have some development programs which can take place locally, so wherever you're based or on an international level. And you have even the international opportunities for you to go out from uh, where you're based and experience to live a professional life abroad. Uh, in the coming slides, um, I, I will go deeper into each of the points I just uh, mentioned. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about trainings, uh, as soon as you join RB, you can expect to have a common training that everyone goes to, uh, which is the global kickoff. Uh, this usually takes place either in Germany or in Thailand, uh, where you get to meet uh, your peers from uh, other international offices. It's a two week long program. So you get to take classes, to go to outdoor events, to meet uh, experts, to do some mock exercises that will uh, give you an idea of what the real life projects look like. In addition to the global kickoff, there are some compulsory trainings, which you do when you rank up as consultants throughout your career. Uh, obviously, due to the current situation, these trainings are currently on hold. And uh, we also have these uh, optional trainings. So these are more on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. So let's say uh, one of you is interested, uh, I don't know, in, uh, in digital. So this person can get the chance to apply to a digital bootcamp in a startup hub that we have that we have in uh, in our headquarters in Germany. And this is one of several options that we have at RB. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So there is more than uh, just being part of trainings. And this is what leads me to development programs. There are four boxes here related to development programs. So the first one is MBA and PhD program, uh, which you can enroll in some years after joining the company. The second one is challenge club. Uh, so this is where top consultants from the level of, uh, of senior consultants and above are invited to take trainings on global level. You have uh, CSR secondment, where uh, you can take a small leave to take a break from uh, typical consulting life and to work on something else. And finally, you have the fellowship program where you can get uh, to develop content for the RB Institute, which is a sort of, uh, of research institute that we have. So as a conclusion, whatever your future path might be, uh, you can be sure that RB will help you reach your objectives. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So that was about uh, development programs. There are also uh, the international opportunities I would like to talk about. Europe, U.S., uh, South, Am South America, Johnny. I think you have uh, the connection is not that great. Yeah. So maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll present uh, those slides until Johnny is back. Yeah. To increase the bandwidth. Is it better now? Uh, it, it, it's okay, Johnny. Let me uh, let me take on uh, th those two slides. So, in Roland Burger, what we have is a lot of international transfers. So you will join uh, uh, the Middle East office if you want. So you can be in, in Saudi, in Bahrain, in, in Dubai, or in Lebanon, let's say. But that does not prevent you from going to any other office in the world. So you can have short-term uh, transfers where you will go up like three months or even three to six months on a project basis. And multiple of our colleagues do that on a continuous basis. We do that to, for people leaving the region going abroad and for people abroad coming to the region. And that's something also quite unique in, in Roland Berger because our size is big, just not huge, right? So we are around 2,500 consultants, 
which uh, is spread around 35 offices, which allows us to really jump between offices and really exchange the knowledge. And that brings a lot of you know, growth in terms of individuals. But there are also long-term transfers. And multiple of our colleagues, for example, from the UK came to the region and from the region, for example, went to uh, Holland or, or to the US. This is when you decide that I want to spend enough time in a certain country and get exposure to the kind of projects and clients that are there. And you can go from one, one, uh, 1.5 to five years, if you like it, right? And we open up 50 opportunities per year, but that really depends on you on how much you want to grow. Now, we've talked a lot about work and then how we can do things, but effectively what we also do a lot is you know work hard play hard and that's really what you see here what we have is we have a lot of opportunities to just get together we understand that the COVID is making life difficult but we are still going to push for what really makes us as a nice family and get together on a continuous basis so every once or twice per year we go for offsites so this is what you will see on the top right corner. Last time we, were, we decided to all go to Thailand. We had a wonderful time there. Uh, uh, lo lots of singing, I must say. But there are also some opportunities to, to travel abroad. So like the kickoff. So kickoff, you can go uh, in Germany. You can go to Brazil. You can go to Thailand. You can go in anywhere around the world. Again, assuming that all this will uh, kick back in from uh, post-COVID. And we also have lots of events in our offices. So we go to Bahrain, we go to Saudi, we go to Lebanon, and we always do those uh, catching up. So whenever we need to do an update of the business, we like to get together and we like to also enjoy the time we are together. Because at the end of the day, in consulting, that's all we have, right? We, we don't have equipment, heavy machinery, you know, pipelines and stuff. We don't really have that. We just have people and we invest in our people and we make sure that they grow like uh, Yannick was saying on the basis of the right values or what uh, my colleague Johnny was explaining based on the trainings and, and the different programs. So... On the work-life balance, this is something we value a lot, right? We allow you to take sabbaticals whenever you need to. Uh, you, you must have heard about the unfortunate incident, for example, that happened in Lebanon. There are multiple people that got really affected and they simply wanted the sabbatical. And we definitely directly gave them that. Some people have uh, maternity or paternity leave and they, or they want to go and spend some time to learn a certain language or to actually just explore something different in life. So they would take sabbaticals and we have that quite open uh, up to six months. We have the model of working part time, especially for working moms, uh, where it is possible to, you know, come a few days a week or uh, come one week, yes, one week, no, etc. So we can work on that. Working from home even before COVID was an option. Now it just became more uh, uh, successful, I, I must say, and more uh, required. Family-oriented support, and this is part of the empathy that Yannick also mentioned. We do understand that there are several situations when people should take care of their parents or their kids or their, uh, any other member of their family or themselves. So we allow for such support to happen. But not only just, you know, okay, you can take some time off. No, we have a community here. We have a wider family. Everybody would like to participate when you want them to. So everybody will, will be supportive on that, uh, on that end. Stress management coaching and mental health in general is a topic that people are simply becoming more aware of it. It has been there forever, but it's something that we truly care about and we watch out for. And finally, the global sports events. I must say, you know, some people think, okay, consultants don't work out, but you'd be amazed by how many runners we have, basketball players and football players and, you know, all, all kinds of sports. So we make sure that people do get the time to uh, enjoy their uh, hobbies, but also participate internally in our firm in such events uh, on a regular basis.
Khalid. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, this is Khalid Bajnaid. You might remember me from the last uh, meeting three months ago. I'm happy to be here again. I'm happy that we got even uh, better numbers than uh, what we uh, achieved last time when we talked to you guys. Uh, so what does consulting really mean uh, for me as uh, being two years now almost in consulting? Uh, really, it's about learning, learning about a lot of different things. As a new uh, graduate and uh, someone who's not uh, expert in any industry, I would I want the main thing I want from consulting is to learn about different things and different functions, be having different interests, and uh, really consulting gives you that. Uh, so far, I've been uh, working uh, almost uh, six or seven different industries. I've got uh, that experience and that exposure to these industries. Uh, all that while being part of a truly um, amazing group of people, smart people, being in a challenging environment and really pushing yourself to the limits, learning a lot about uh, um, Okay. Yeah, so uh, can, you, can you guys can hear you? me well? Okay. Yeah. Um, secondly, um, also, oh, by the way, I'm really happy that we're uh, doing this initiative with the Saudi students. I know that and this is really changing over the years. And this is one example of that. Uh, we're getting a lot of exposure to this um, and uh, Saudis are becoming a lot more ambitious and want to work in top tier firms. And this is something really that excites me personally and I'm um, excited for that. Um, so what does uh, something else about consulting that I like is pushing you to the limit that you thought you can't, that you, you didn't think you fast-tracked your career by putting you uh, out of your comfort zone. Um, a bit about uh, who I am as a person. I'm uh, from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. I've been a uh, graduate, or I've been to Penn State University, graduated with uh, two degrees in statistics and economics. I'm a huge sports fan, an airport, and I probably like either play it or watch it. Um, this is a picture of uh, me in Thailand, actually, at a, an office meeting. Uh, so this is uh, one of the things that Hani was uh, talking about, having offsites. Uh, we had uh, our last office meeting in last November in, uh, in Phuket, Thailand. Uh, this is one of the pictures over there. We took a boat. Uh, it was uh, pretty nice. Why Roland Berger? For me personally, the great work atmosphere. Um, you really like across all levels. I have uh, I have friends in RB that I can call at any time and I, I can hang out with outside work and inside work. Most of the teams that uh, I've been with, I've ended up being close friends to, the people that I actually work with. Uh, this is something that I don't think you can find in, uh, in any company. Um, another thing is that for an ambitious uh, for ambitious people like yourselves, uh, you can always uh, feel listened to and you can always push your, uh, your own ideas and uh, take higher responsibilities if you wish to, which is something amazing about RB. Highlights about my consulting career, uh, four different countries, seven different industries in less than two years, uh, being part of senior level meetings, uh, contributing uh, and learning a lot about uh, and getting exposed to things I wouldn't be exposed to. Uh, if I was in, uh, in a different industry, in my opinion. Uh, lastly, travel and hotel stays. I'm not very good at cleaning my clothes, uh, so I like having uh, laundry done by hotel. Uh, obviously, that's pre-COVID. Now I learned it the hard way. I'm doing good so far, uh, but yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna show you the rest of the talk because I'm not very good at ironing. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's all. And uh, yeah, hope to see a lot of you guys in the, in the office.
Assalamu alaikum everyone. Hello. So this is Khail talking. Um, so I'll be touching on three points. I joined RB a year ago, uh, graduated from a school in the US, Emory University, majoring in economics and political science. Um, and probably the highlight here, you know, you know, probably most of you are majoring in engineering, but what's fascinating one consulting, um, that everyone, you have people coming from all walks of life, you know, from engineering, business, um, to, you know, psychology, etc. So it's, um, I'd be surprised if you meet somebody who majors in something rather than business or engineering. Um, second, I'll touch on YRB. Uh, Hani mentioned earlier that you know we have a relatively so small office, and that gives you a lot of opportunities to take on initiatives and start a new thing in the company, whether it be in a club for you know soccer or some specific meeting or in a new industry that you want to have meetings for. Uh, so this is honestly what makes RB unique when it's, you know compared to other uh, companies that have a huge number of people. Uh, third a highlight of my consulting career and here just you know not to uh, sort of uh, wash the stigma of consulting being time consuming working a lot behind the desk it's uh, actually rather the opposite uh, during my time with RB I had worked on a, a plastic uh, project and we had to visit multiple factories south of Riyadh and, and other areas in KSA and it was really fascinating because we were hands-on. We had to go to these factories and understand the working they do. Um, and it, 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 it's really, uh, it was very insightful. And it wasn't, of course, there was the desktop work, but uh, this is something that we rare to encounter in other uh, industry. Second, working on a project with a client where we uh, went to these three sites that they had, uh, land, air, and sea and seeing their operations and how things are conducted, uh, it's, it's definitely something unique. You know, Jumping from plastic factories to this kind of industry is also something interesting. Uh, third, to touch on the training. I mean, it might sound like it's something so rigid and uh, tiresome, which it is, but it also could be fun. Uh, in my training last year, in September actually, like this month last year, I was in South of Germany for my kickoff training for two weeks, and uh, we were stationed in a lodge next to the highest peak in South Germany. I can't pronounce the name, but it was definitely a fascinating place to be at. So uh, that's in a nutshell, um, you know, an introduction about me. Just a quick thing to reference the quote I mentioned earlier about consulting, you know, having highs and lows. I think, you know, joining an RP would probably put uh, your university's uh, reputation to test being tough and rigid, uh, RBS definitely matches that. So thank you, everyone. Okay, exciting talk. Uh, this is Yasser Al Barakat. Uh, I am from the MAM, uh, Saudi Arabia, and I joined RB about a year and a half ago. Uh, right now, I am a junior consultant at RB. I think, um, Abdaziz, you made a mistake uh, challenging them uh, with their <laughs> university. So <laughs> I hear that a lot. Game students always brag about their university. So uh, <laughs> time to put um, it to test. <laughs> Maybe it's not a mistake. <laughs> true, true. Okay, so um, today I'm going to be talking about how can you join. Uh, so um, could you go to the next? Yeah. Oh, exactly. So right now, we, we basically um, value diversity, as Hani mentioned earlier. We uh, attract consultants from all backgrounds. And as you can see here on the left side, uh, we have uh, quite a bit of engineering, sciences, and business students uh, specifically. But uh, this is not the only students that, that we attract. We attract all students uh, in general. And for the degrees, you see that uh, the backgrounds that we take, we take pretty much everything, like from bachelors to PhDs uh, all over. OK. OK, so now uh, when you join, most likely you will be joining as a business analyst. And, and uh, then this is the uh, career path that you have within RB. So as a BA, basically, you will be mostly focused on research, market analysis, and uh, project support. So uh, you, you will get uh, guided uh, support from your senior colleagues. So you will be most likely working with a consultant or a senior consultant or, or, or even a PM. And as you move uh, within your career, uh, you will be a junior consultant where you will have more ownership over your tasks and you will uh, participate more actively in meetings and so on. 
And then as you progress within your career, basically you will be responsible for certain modules within the, the, the project uh, leading to becoming a project manager, managing the whole project. And then toward the end, basically principal and partner, uh, they will be mostly responsible for acquisition, for sales, for uh, corporate development and leadership, basically. Okay, so today, uh, right now we have the, the we, we have the Riyadh office and we are introducing co-op right now with KFUPM and we are targeting high potential KFUPM students. So uh, we are uh, right now introducing this program. Uh, the, uh, the link is, is already open and we have received some applications already. And right now, the key dates that we have for the co-op program is by the end of next month, by the end of October. So in one month from now, basically. So, so in October, basically, uh, this is the application deadline. Then in November and December, it will be mostly for interviews and onboarding. And then we are looking to start the co-op program in January. Okay, so right now, um, when you apply, what's gonna happen? Uh, you will apply and then you will, uh, and the application, uh, we will do some pre-selection based, based on your CV, based on uh, your uh, credentials and based on your online assessment. And then you will get an invitation to three rounds of interviews. So the first and second rounds of interviews, basically you will have case uh, interviews and then you will have a personal uh, interview uh, part as well. And then on the last interview, you will have a final interview with a partner. So this is the, the process of interviews in general. And generally speaking, it doesn't take that long. So only apply, uh, so make sure that before you apply that you are prepared. And in the next slide, we will explain how you can prepare for the interviews. So first step is to find materials. So make sure that you have the, the, the material that you need for, for uh, the case interviews, because um, if you are a good applicant, then you must like uh, invest some time in preparing for interviews and making sure that you are ready to do these interviews. So uh, some resources here are Rep Lounge, Victor Chang, uh, and the case bo uh, books that we have from different business schools. Then once you have the material, basically I would invite all of you to, to practice with colleagues, with uh, friends who are also interested in consulting and uh, to try it out basically, because um, it, it's gonna take some time before you start to master these uh, case interviews. And then basically apply when you feel that you are confident enough to pass the, the uh, interviews. Maybe right now I will, uh, if you go back to the previous slides, maybe it's, we can do a, a couple of polls just to understand the audience and understand basically uh, what, what is the level that we are looking at right now. I'm, I'm just going to, launch one uh, question, if you could answer it. Do you see the question? Yes, I think okay. we can see it. Okay, so let's um, see basically what are the, um, how many cases have you guys done and then uh, what is the level uh, that you are at at the moment? Yeah, I think the majority right now, they are at, uh, they, they, ha they, they either haven't started yet or they have one to 10 uh, cases done, uh, one to 10 practice cases. And uh, what this means basically is that it's, it's, uh, it's very important for you guys to basically focus on the first part uh, to basically find the right material and uh, prepare for the interviews. Um, and basically, if you feel confident enough, then that's when you can uh, um, continue with the process. Yes. 
think we can move on uh, and um, right now, since Arvind is already here, we can skip the questions and go to the TED talk and then we can have one Q&A session after the uh, talk with Arvind. Arvind? Yeah, hi everyone. Perfect. Uh, yes, just a question. How are we doing in terms of time? Because the you problem are... is that sometimes I, I start on automotive and I just keep on going. <laughs> we are quite tight on time. We have okay. um, ideally 10 minutes, but I think maybe we can take a bit more. Okay, sure. Let, let me let me yeah, try to do that. We can extend that to whatever you need, guys. Perfect. Thank you so much. Good. So first of all, let me introduce myself. I think I skipped that part. Uh, I am Arvind. I'm a senior project manager with Roland Berger. Uh, I've been with Roland Berger for the last uh, eight and a half years now. And uh, my focus, as you can see on the topic, it's, it's automotive. And uh, I've been working, let's say, in the region for now three, three and a half years and uh, specifically quite a lot of action happening in KSA. So let's, I mean, like we will we'll go through this particular, uh, some of these slides and uh, where I'll cover more of, let's say the automotive sector in general, and then get a bit more into what are the kind of projects which, which we will be, I mean, like, which we typically do and, and how it would look like for anyone. Perfect. So first, uh, if you look at the automotive value chain itself, um, it's, it's quite a complex one in the sense where if you look at it from the engineering uh, perspective to manufacturing until the vehicle ownership and recycling, there are quite a lot of uh, uh, companies, quite a lot of stakeholders um, which, which need to be managed. So that way, uh, if you look at, for example, in engineering, well, I mean, like you, you can look at it from materials side, you can look at fuel systems, uh, and that with electric coming up, that, that's opening up a, a, an even bigger, uh, let's say, research-related part. Then vehicle engineering, and then once you shift into manufacturing, you, of course, have the raw material. The vehicles, again, the vehicles can range from passengers to construction equipment to agri-equipment. Uh, and once you move into the sales related part, you have the retail part of it, then you have the fleet management side. So that way, the, the life cycle of a, a vehicle or a car is, is, is quite long and tedious. Uh, and as you may see, there will be, of course, challenges across each and every part of these particular uh, areas. And that's basically where, uh, my focus area is, I mean, like, and I, I would say we, we focus on most part of the value chain. If we move to the next, to next slide, let's skip uh, this COVID one. Yes, maybe even next one, please. Yes, the main. Yes, thank you. So if you look at what's what's happening in this, in this sector right now, uh, what, what we have developed is something called as the MADE framework. Uh, which is to evaluate what are the key mega trends which, which are right now uh, impacting the industry. So if you look at what, what this MADE stands for, one, is, I mean, like M is mobility. Mobility is where people are shifting from owning to more of a shared transportation, uh, where uh, what we say is usership, to, sorry, ownership to usership. And I'm pretty sure a lot of, people who are participating in, in this call are already thinking about not owning a vehicle, but rather only using a vehicle. Uh, and at least I know that some of my colleagues are I mean, like definitely fans of Ubers and Kareems and not exactly owning vehicles. So that way we, we can see this, let's say shift, which is happening across the regions even today. Uh, the second, let's say mega trend is the autonomous side of things. Uh, autonomous, uh, let's say a few years back was, uh, was kind of uh, hyped up as, let's say, one of the biggest trends or let's say something which is going to keep coming up. But in the recent past, uh, this has kind of subsidized, um, it's uh, kind of uh, toned down a bit. And autonomous, while we talk about uh, 
uh, more of driver safety related mechanism and so on, uh, which will come up in the next few years. But pure autonomous, uh, I mean, like not listening to Elon Musk is still a few years away for sure. So it's it's more the later part of the decade where you will see more of, uh, let's say, hands-off kind of driving, like level four kind of autonomy. Uh, the autonomy where level five, where the driver itself is not required, that's still going to take beyond 2030 at least. Uh, in terms of the third one, which is digitized, it's more about connected car, uh, V2V kind of message, V2X uh, related architecture. So that is something which is kind of catching up where uh, vehicles are getting more and more connected. And uh, you also would have, I mean, like so, some part of it is also aligned with, let's say, the autonomous part where you're able to kind of make sure that the vehicles talk with each other. So they share their sensors. So that way you, you can kind of drive towards it. So digitize is more like a, a, a pre uh, this one trend for the autonomous to eventually come up. And the last one, which is definitely not the least, which is happening across uh, is the electrification of the powertrain. So here we see that uh, a vehicle from your normal internal combustion engines, it's, it's shifting more towards uh, pure battery electric vehicle. Uh, and if you look at uh, Volkswagen, well, like we recently launched the ID3, the ID4. So that way the your conventional OEMs have now started picking up their pace and they are kind of like coming coming like really aggressive. So in the next, uh, let's say three to four years, you should have a few hundred models which are being launched, uh, which will be just pure battery electric vehicles. So that's the, the hottest segment which is there right now. And there's, there's quite a lot happening on that front. If we move to the next slide. Yes, uh, if you look at how these four mega trends are going to evolve. So it's not that, all of them are going to evolve at the same pace, or uh, let's say, for example, there is going to be a single end state. And that's also the, the, the challenge which almost every player in, in the value chain is facing right now, which is uh, where do we see this moving forward, right? If, if the regulations change in, in any of these countries, uh, and again, for example, the US or Europe, if there are regulatory changes which support more of autonomy, then of course it shifts much more faster. Uh, if we look at uh, no major regulatory push, then you would have a much slower um, adoption of these technologies. But eventually the end state is where you will have, let's say fully autonomous robocabs kind of uh, uh, a future. Moving to the next one. Yes, what this means for the, the players who are there. So. On the left, you have your typical traditional OEMs, the new OEMs, the OES is original equipment suppliers and so on. But if you look at more towards the right, it's more of service providers, right? So it's mobility service providers who are going to be more of uh, the, the ones which will take uh, the, uh, the share of profits. So that way, what we have today is that on the left, the traditional OEMs and the OESs, they have to really look at how they are going to address the new uh, trends. Uh, and like I gave the example of Volkswagen, uh, where they have to shift from yeah, their conventional uh, ICE engine to more of uh, EVs. What that also means is once you shift towards electric vehicle, your requirement for let's say mechanical repairs and so on kind of drops down quite, uh, quite well. So that way, if they have an external third party network, then where do those uh, parties kind of go and earn their profit margins? So that's a huge question mark. Uh, for Tesla, for some of the new players, that's the reason why they are also addressing that they will have their own distribution network. The advantage is that one, the customer experience is much more standardized, but at the same time, you don't have to depend on a third party who is going to kind of try to extract margins from the customers. So. That way, this particular area is, is going to uh, change quite a lot. And as you can see, 
It is also a gray part on the right, which is out of business. So, of course, there are going to be a few players who are going to go out of business eventually because the profit margins are going to be only so much. Uh, moving to the next one. Yes, so specifically looking at KSA. So as a part of one of uh, the, the studies which we launch every six months, which is the automotive disruption radar. So that tracks uh, uh, the, the disruption in automotive across uh, 30 different uh, cities. So if you look at uh, this ADR, uh, we have included Saudi Arabia as a country uh, in this particular study. The other country which is there is uh, UAE in the region. So if we look specifically at the results which we have got for KSA, uh, one of the things is, I mean, like we, were, I, I was personally quite surprised in some of these, uh, let's say, results. Uh, in fact, we missed out one of the, uh, let's say, a, a more, even more surprising result, which is in terms of how open would you be to buying an electric vehicle? So I think in that one, Saudi Arabia scores like in the top five, where people are willing to buy an electric vehicle. Of course, there is no uh, charging station or let's say there is no infrastructure which is available today. But then from a mindset perspective, people are more than happy to buy uh, an electric vehicle. So that way, it's, it's, it's really something which we need to take into account where uh, KSA already has a 5G rollout. KSA has these shared mobility related areas. We are also looking at uh, uh, shared mobility related uh, usage also increasing. So that way, what uh, we can at least expect in KSA is that with the right regulatory push, a lot of these things or a lot of these trends would really expedite in, in the market itself. And that is something which we are also uh, working with several uh, stakeholders within KSA itself. And as you may know, through the Vision Fund, uh, PIF, and I mean, uh, as KSA, uh, you do have quite a lot of investments in, in many of these players. I mean, like one of the examples is who's Uber. Uh, plus, uh, if you look at the larger value chain, then we are also talking about Park Jockey. I mean, like, there are like so many players. I mean, like one of the other ones is Lucid, of course, where PIF invested around $1.3 billion, um, I think around a year and a half back. And Lucid just now, I mean, like recently unveiled their production vehicle. So that way, KSA also has made investments largely around targeting this mobility or let's say the automotive trends but the future is around how we are able to leverage all of these for the development of KSA and overall vision 2030. Moving to the next slide. Yes, so in terms of looking at who do we typically work with, um, just also give you a flavor of, of what, what we do and in, in this particular sector. So this is a, a snapshot of the global clients who we work with. And like I said, we work across the value chain, uh, including investors, government agencies, and so on. And in KSA specifically, uh, I mean, like uh, you, you may see the logos uh, up below, which is, I mean, like we work with industrial clusters, we work, uh, we work with PIF uh, quite extensively. We've also worked with Dusur. Uh, we worked with, uh, I think some of these logos might be hidden with the uh, uh, ALJ before. So, so that way we we worked with quite a few uh, let's say the local entities. Plus we've also worked with OEMs like Nissan uh, for their KSC specific strategy. And just as an example, uh, these projects could be around let's say uh, how do we develop the human capability uh, for the automotive industry? And and it feels fits so very well with the call we are just having right now because. As a part of that particular project, we were looking at how do we ensure that engineering graduates from some of these universities are well equipped to address the requirements of the automotive industry, especially when manufacturing comes through. Uh, I cannot give too much of details on automotive manufacturing, but what's happening in KSA, but yes, I mean, that's something which is high on the agenda, I would say. Uh, and in fact, as a part of it, KFUPM, like we had interacted with the Dean of Mechanical Engineering for making sure that we are getting enough support. So that is something which, which is ongoing, I would say. 
plus as i mean like the other project examples are around let's say the automotive supplier localization roadmap and so on and what you would see maybe in a typical project in the next slide i think that would be the last one so uh, exactly so so it, it, if if you look at a typical project so if we, if let's say for example uh, it would be that uh, either DIF or let's say uh, a, a different agency in, in KSA kind of come up with the question around, should we build trucks in Saudi Arabia? So that's basically nothing but a feasibility study where we have to look at what, what can be done in KSA itself. So immediately after that, what you technically do is you look at the market, you look at the capabilities. So it's more of a uh, let's say what what is from a demand side and what is from a supply side. So if you can kind of like bucket it over there. So end of the day, I mean, like linking this back to some of the cases which you are preparing for, this is exactly how we will also structure a typical project. And that's the reason why I think cases are also important where it's more of the, the logical thinking and how you're able to ask the right questions and make sure that you're focusing on the right aspects. So that's what is most critical, I would say. And again, I mean, I have been lucky enough that my focus has been on automotive. And by the way, I'm a mechanical engineer by background and I was a, a, a vehicle engineer for three years, even before I joined consulting. So for me, this, this is I mean, like, this is my, my passion and everything, right? So uh, I'm pretty sure there are a few engineers on this call who are also, I mean, like, very keen on automotive, but in consulting, one of the advantages is also that you will be able to see different aspects of like several industries. So it's not that you, you are stuck with a specific industry in the beginning, but it's rather about looking at how do I, how do I answer a specific issue? How do I address that specific issue and eventually moving ahead? And of course, eventually you will uh, uh, specialize in a specific field, and if it is on automotive, I would be more than happy to have you guys on board. Uh, but then it's 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 really a matter of let's say at at let's say the starting, you should be able to focus or let's say you you need to have a view on several industries so that you're able to build the logical related part quite well. So I think that brings us to the end of our TED talk. I'm quite happy that I was able to finish that off in like 15 minutes. Okay, thanks, uh, Arvin. So now we open the floor for questions. Any questions from the audience, uh, either on the presentation or on the TED Talk by uh, Arvin? Okay, guys, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, CJ uh, and the uh, RV team, thanks for Hani. Hani have uh, left us. Before we start with the q and I would like to uh, to present my sincerest apology uh, due to the technical problem of the maximum limit. I think there is a, a technical issue with the, with the subscri so our subscription, but it will be resolved uh, shortly after this event. Uh, for now, please uh, convey your questions your friends' questions who couldn't join us. Uh, we also sent a, we have sent an email uh, and collected all questions from people who couldn't join. Uh, and uh, thankfully the session is recorded, so there is nothing to miss. Uh, we will share, of course, the link uh, uh, with matter of days uh, with you guys. For now, uh, Yasser, I have sent you the questions uh, via WhatsApp. I think you should be able to start tackling them, and they'll be here to assess if needed. Yes, uh, just one question for you, uh, Abdullah. Halian, uh, can the audience speak or they cannot uh, speak right now? We can, if you want to. Ah, okay. Okay. Speak. Okay. Uh, so I think um, maybe um, if there is a future where they can, uh, if, if somebody wants to speak, he can raise his hands. Can we have do we have this feature here? Yep, I think so. Okay, so then we can do it this way. 
So if uh, anybody has a question from the audience, uh, he can basically raise his hand and then uh, we can... Uh, we have Ahmed al -Awal already. Okay. So let's hear from Ahmed. Yeah, you can take the lead, Abdullah, and unmute him, okay? Or I can do it on my end, either or. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I have a question for CJ about uh, construction uh, of vehicles in Saudi Arabia. Please go ahead. Yeah, the question is, uh, isn't isn't it more complex to construct uh, electric uh, vehicles in Saudi Arabia rather than uh, constructing an uh, ICE engines uh, vehicles? Because uh, the, uh, I mean the. We don't have places for uh, like uh, charging electricity for cars. That will be like a huge project. I mean, we are talking about maybe 10 years or maybe 20 years ahead. Rather than if we can uh, create uh, or reconstruct the ICE vehicles here in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yes, so in terms of looking at electric versus ice vehicle. So if, if you look at uh, internal combustion engines, so if, if we look at how the market is evolving right now, uh, there are quite limited investments which are happening even from the manufacturers in terms of getting more technology from the ice engine because you have so such stringent emission standards which are coming up in the US and in Europe that it doesn't make any sense for manufacturers to be optimizing internal combustion engines any longer. So what they are going to be doing is they're gonna pump in a lot of their money into developing hybrids and electric vehicles. And that being the case, what that means is they also will not be investing too much into additional capacity with respect to internal combustion engines. So if we, if we look at it that from that particular angle and from a future growth aspect, right? So as, as KSA, I mean, like what, what would I want to invest into? I mean, like, would it be a market segment which will decline in the next 10 to 20 years? Or should I be looking at a market where I can invest and do, and it, it has a significant growth potential, not only for the next 20 years, but even beyond. So it, it eventually comes into that particular area. Uh, and given that, and in fact, one of the biggest advantages for KSA is that you don't have the baggage of an existing ICE production, right? So you don't have any vehicle production with respect to cars today. So if that is the case, then you should rather focus on investing into electric vehicles so that it's not that you invest into one particular item and then you, you upgrade to the next one. Uh, maybe just to give you an example, I mean, I'm, I'm from India. So if I look at how the telecom market evolved, so if you look at, uh, uh, I mean, like you, you of course have your landlines and then you have your mobile phones. And uh, uh, if I look at 25 years back or even 30 years back, uh, having a landline in your home used to be a big issue uh, in the sense you need to get the license, the, the, the company has to come and set it up. So you, there used to be a long waiting time. So if you look at it as, a, as a, a gradual or a linear growth, then of course, by today, only let's say 40 or 50% of the population would have had phones. But then instead of going through the landline, landline road, they took a mobile phone related part. But look at where we are today. I mean, like we're talking about a billion plus mobile phone connections over there. And that's one of the areas where you have the, the lowest rates for data and so on. So that's basically all about leapfrogging. So you're not bound by a specific technology, but you're going to the next level. So while today it may not be a big, or let's say it, it may not be the most attractive thing for KSA from an electric vehicle side, but the future holds good, and that's basically where the market is. I hope that answers your question, Ahmed. Yeah, thank you. 
Okay. Give thanks. me a thumbs up. Yes. I think, I think he cannot uh, unmute himself. Uh, I hope it, uh, it does. You can uh, text also uh, or uh, write me a message or write CJ a message. Uh, thank you, CJ, for your informative answer. Now we will go with Abdul Majid. Majid, you should, uh, should, should be able to. Yes. Uh, my question is, what are you looking for in uh, an application uh, for a business analyst? Uh, any skills or uh, uh, any skills that we should develop or anything that we should focus on? I can take this. So basically, um, we are looking for all background. There is um, no specific background that we are looking for. What we are looking for, we are looking for excellence, uh, if I had to describe it in one word. Um, so we are hiring civil engineers. We're hiring all different types of engineers and other majors as well. Uh, and as, as you have seen in the presentation, uh, our firm generally is quite diverse in terms of backgrounds, in terms of degrees, and so on. Uh, in terms of preparations, I would say that uh, you need to first work on your CVs and work on your uh, cover letter because this is the first thing that we read when we uh, do the, the, the pre-qualification, basically. Uh, so make sure that they, they are sharp and there are no mistakes, uh, there, uh, it would represent your story and so on. Then basically I would recommend that you focus on the case interview skills. Uh, make sure that you do enough cases uh, to feel that you are confident to ace uh, one of the uh, interviews, basically. Uh, because at the end of the day, the, the CV would only get you uh, to the first interview. And then once you are uh, in the first interview, then it's all about your, your performance and how you are doing on the, in the interviews. Perfect. Thank you, Yasser. Uh, now we can go with uh, Ahmed. Uh, yes, salam alaikum. Uh, I have a question. Does uh, Roland Berger uh, hire the civil engineering student? And uh, if the answer is yes, uh, what is uh, the work or consultant uh, in the field of uh, civil engineering that uh, we can work uh, in it. Thank you. Yep, that's uh, that's a good question. In general, as I mentioned, yeah, we, we, we hire all majors. Uh, there is no um, specific major that we don't have. We, we definitely welcome this diversity. We value this diversity. And if you are coming from an engineering background, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will be working on an engineering technical project. So as you know, yani consulting, um, it, it, it would require lots of skills and there's lots of uh, soft skills as well that you will be learning on the job during your uh, first uh, couple of weeks on the project. And uh, so you could be working on one day on, on an automotive project and then on the next month, you, you could be working on um, an engineering project um, in the engineering industry. And then next month, you could be working in the public sector and so on. So not necessarily um, you will be focused on one industry, especially when you first join as a business analyst. Uh, so when you first join, usually you will do multiple projects in multiple industries. And then as you progress in your career, that's when you specialize in one industry. Yeah, adding to what y Yasser just mentioned. So what, one thing is like, like Yasser mentioned, it, it's not that we are looking for a specific specialization as yet, right? Uh, given that you, you're all fresh graduates, so that way they, it's, it's not that we are looking for mechanical engineers or civil engineers or even engineers for that matter. Uh, because I've had colleagues who are, who are lawyers or they've done law major. So that way it's, it's truly a mix and a diverse set of pe people who will be there. And uh, as mentioned before, what, what you should be also, I mean, like looking at is that when we talk about consulting, it's not, we don't, I mean, like consulting is actually quite a generic term that way, 
right? So you have technical consulting, you have uh, legal consulting, you have management consulting. What we are doing is more of around the management consulting side of things. And here it's not detailed engineering related aspects, or let's say we, we try to put civil engineers into a specific bucket or mechanical engineers into a specific bucket. It's rather uh, at, the, at the early stages, it's more industry agnostic. And like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's more about how you think through the problem, how you structure this, are you able to deliver the right answers for the clients, right? So I think that's what is the most important skill set. It's not so much about the technical side of things. Yeah, just a quick note to add to that to everyone, uh, because I remember being in their shoes a couple of years ago. When it comes to consulting, especially for you guys, it's not that you will be you are you know applying for a Ramco or for one of the other companies where you know exactly it's going to be very engineer engineering focused. Where you if you are chemical, we do chemical related stuff. If it's electrical, we electrical, etc. Rather, you will be you know what you learn in engineering in essence. It's you look at the problem, whether it be in an engine or a you know plant or whatever that is, uh, you dissect it. You synthesize what's the issue, what are the proposed solutions, and then you present that to your manager, with if, if you, you know, if you're working in a team, and then to the client. And it's in essence that's what consulting is about: having the skills to synthesize, you know, knowing how to collect data, how to read data, how to interpret data and present them, is what uh, consulting comes down to. In addition to having really interpersonal and communication skills, so. Uh, I would say it's it's not a job where you you know you're applying to us and you expect to become a titled engineer. You know you would leave all the engineering expectation. I'm talking about a traditional track behind, and in consulting you would venture into something completely different. Of course, you'll be using that as Arvind uh, hinted to in his presentation, but it's 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 in essence about these skills, synthesizing you know uh, understanding issues and presenting solutions to them. Perfect. Thank you guys for your uh, informative answers. Uh, we have questions, a question from Ahmed. Um, good evening, uh, RB. I'd like to ask you, when are you going to open the application for the BA position? And thank you. Thanks, Ahmed. Uh, it should be already open right now. So if you go to the uh, website, uh, there is a job uh, position that's already open. Um, is it... A business analyst or junior consultant? I'm looking for the business analyst position. It is the business analyst position. So this is the entry uh, job uh, position that we have. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Ahmed. Uh, now we'll go with Faisal. Faisal, you should be able to un unmute yourself. Yes, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my question is in regard to the, uh, the co-op opportunity. Um, can KSU, KSU students apply for this uh, opportunity or not? Or is it just KFUPM? Right now, we are targeting KFUPM specifically. Uh, so uh, KFUPM students will be given the priority. Uh, but uh, you are uh, more than welcome to apply as well. Perfect. Thanks, Faisal. Uh, now we'll go with Abdurrahman. I'm going with the highest. Uh, I hope I'm going in the right order. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, my question is a bit general, and I'm suffering from this problem. Uh, what should I write in my CV to make it presentable and show my soft skills? Because I cannot just say bullet points of my soft skills. How can I show you that I have the right soft skills? For this, maybe if, if Arvind, do you want to comment on this? No, I think uh, Arvind had to leave us. He is on the next call since we were scheduled uh, only until uh, 7 p.m. But uh, can you just, so uh, are you talking about your CV or your uh, cover letter? Ah, you can't answer. Okay, so generally, the CV. CV, okay. Generally, I would say 
in, in your CV, um, you would have a section on your education and you would have here a section on your, um, let's say, work experience. That could be internships, right? Where you're describing in a few bullets what you have been doing. And then typically what I have done in the past when I was applying, I had a section on, um, I called it extracurricular activities, right? That was about let's say softer things that I was doing on the side. So whether that is, I don't know, I was, I was teaching students uh, English or math back then, for instance, right? Or uh, you, you can mention the passions that you have on the side in that section. So whether that is, okay, you're a competitive basketball player and of a certain level, or you are a passionate violinist, something like this. This you can describe there. And this is uh, perfectly fine in my opinion to also put this on the CD, right? Just overall, as a recommendation, I would always just keep a CV to like one page, um, keep it to the key, key points, uh, and that should be good. And then uh, there's always the opportunity to also convey these soft skills then um, in the cover letter where you're describing a bit why you're applying and uh, showing how you are bringing the sufficient or the right skills to the table. And then eventually, these things uh, will then also be put to the test during the interviews. So um, I think there's plenty of opportunity for you to convey that. Yeah. Uh, one thing to add on this, uh, this is honest, uh, I, I totally agree with everything that uh, Yannick mentioned. And on top of this, I would say um, the obvious, which is um, do your homework before you apply, you read uh, the company, uh, read the requirements and everything, and make sure that when you write the CV and you write the cover letter that you are corresponding to this. Uh, so we see generally lots of applications where people would, would, uh, with strong credentials and everything. But um, when, when they apply, when we read the, uh, the CVs or cover letters, we see that um, this is the same CV that they have applied for, for um, uh, engineering firms, for example. It's, uh, so it's, it's not clear for us why uh, they are interested in consulting. So Showing interest in consulting, uh, I think uh, this can be uh, one good thing that you can improve on your application. Okay, thank you, Yasser and uh, Yannick. Now we will go with uh, Mohammed Al Ahmadi. Salam alaikum. First of all, I want to, to thank you all for giving us the chance to see this presentation. My question is, uh, I am a graduate student uh, with a BS degree in civil engineering. Let's say I do not have chance to go to any consulting company uh, and I go to the construction fields or in the transportation, uh, trans uh, transport transportation fields for let's say six months or one year. And I want to come back to the uh, consulting field. Is Ronald Burger uh, accept just the British graduate or with any experience? This is my question. Thank you. Yeah, so basically we accept um, all people. Uh, maybe uh, Abdelaziz, if you can go to the, uh, to the slide that we talk about the positions. If you go up. Presentation, yeah, a bit more. Yes, here. So basically, uh, the entry position that we have is as a business analyst. But if you come with experience, if you come with an MBA, for example, then you can enter as, as a junior consultant. And if you have some work experience, then you, you can enter as a consultant. But that would depend on your background and what have you done uh, in your career. Uh, so and uh, your performance within the interviews as well. So definitely, the answer is yes. We do accept people who are coming from from the uh, from the industry in general, and uh, basically that's why we have different levels. Is that because based on your experience, based on what you have done and your education, then you can sort on different uh, career uh, positions. Yeah, and just to add to Yasser, um, actually, you know, it's not only accepted, it's actually uh, encouraged and wanted, right? We are looking for people that have made the industry experience, right? That 
we then can leverage on these projects. So if you have experience from your work in a specific field, right? And this is something where we are doing uh, projects in, which is a lot of field, it's a very broad range, then this is actually very much welcomed. So uh, definitely, uh, it's an option to uh, first go out, make an experience in the industry, and then co join consulting. Okay, so I think we have time to take one more question, one last question before we close. We have to close at 7.30. Apparently, some of us have meetings, but one last question. Okay, we can go with the uh, magic. Okay. Uh, just building off of the cover letter uh, response, do you generally seek more personable cover letters or do you want uh, ones that are rigid or just simply give more details to what was already mentioned in the CV? So, um, could you repeat your question again? I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, just generally speaking, do you seek more uh, personable cover letters or ones that are follow the rigid structure that is expected from cover letters? No, there is no uh, rich structure. It's, it's just a cover letter at the end of the day. And what we are looking for is that the CV would give us um, some information, key facts about you, but then the cover letter will be an opportunity for you to convey your interest, to, to basically uh, share with us information that is not on the CV. Um, and uh, basically, we, yeah, I mean, cover letter would give us another perspective uh, about you, and it is one of the tools that we use to evaluate candidates. Okay, and uh, just one additional remark on this. Um, while I agree, agree with Yasa <clears throat> on the cover letter, you really want to convey, <clears throat> sorry, you really want to convey why you are looking to uh, start a career in consulting, right? And this why and why why are consulting and why Roland Berger, perhaps? Right? This is not really coming across on your CV where you are talking about your accomplishments. In the cover letter, you're, let's say, conveying a message of like, why is it that you want to join, right? And uh, I agree with Yasa, definitely put some thoughts into it, right? Uh, and this can be personal, right? Definitely, but put some thoughts into why is it that you're inter interested in this industry, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, we're looking for people that are very passionate about what they're doing. So uh, the job is demanding a lot, definitely, right? So uh, if you have to do it wholeheartedly. And uh, if we can tell from your application and the cover letter that you are going to be one of those candidates that are in it wholeheartedly, then uh, and, uh, really passionate about that job, then uh, I think this is, this is the right way to go. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Yasser and uh, Yannick. We are very happy now to, to conclude our session today. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't cover uh, all the questions, but of course, you're more than welcome to connect with uh, RP at social media, uh, their social media accounts and uh, ask all your questions. We do have one final poll before we end. Please uh, kindly uh, answer uh the last question while i'm ending uh, thank you all for your participation thank you uh for uh, for your interest and of course uh, many thanks to our guests today uh roland berger team uh we're happy to uh, that we had uh, we have hosted them and many of them uh, or uh, as many companies they are showing great interest in uh, KFM students, and we're happy that uh, we have connected you guys. Uh, at the end, uh, please make sure that you follow all our uh, social media accounts uh, at uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, also at our website, cakeconsultingclub.com, uh, uh, where you can find many resources that help you to join uh, top consulting firms, where, uh, and also where we answer many of the questions that you uh, you ask uh, for each and uh, every company visit. Uh, we are happy now to uh, to stay if, if you have any extra questions for the club. Uh, but other than that, we're, uh, uh, we're done. And thank you all for participating. And uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, RB, for joining us today.
يعطيك العافية عبد الله يعطيكم العافية الجميع شكرا ياك الله ياك بروكاس سي يو بس تفلك تبرون السلام عليكم يعطيكم العافية جميعا يعطيك العافية عبد الله الله يعافيك حياكم الله